It's time for your weekly financial workout with your elite personal trainers, Ryan and Bob Payne, guiding you on how to build a stronger and more robust financial plan. So get ready. We're about to pump you up. Live from the greatest city in the world, this is No Pain, No Gain. Good morning. It's No Pain, No Gain Financial Radio. I'm your host, Ryan Payne, president of Payne Capital Management, along with Chief Investment Officer, my father, the man with the plan, Bob Payne. Good morning, Big Bob. What's happening? Morning, son. Uh, well, you know, nothing better in life than spending a Sunday morning with you on the radio here in the Great Apple. In the, I'm sorry, in the Big Apple. Hey, get it right, Bob. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it is. It's always a pleasure. And as always, we have some great topics to cover this morning to help you on your path to financial freedom. We're going to cover risk tolerance. How much risk can you really handle in your portfolio versus how much risk you actually need in your portfolio? We're going to dive into that. We're going to talk about bad financial advisors. There's a lot of them out there. What are the warning signs that you're not working with the best financial professional? We're going to call out the bad financial advisors of the world. And of course, we have this week's financial pornography. We're going to point out the things that you need to weed out when you're watching the financial news and our spotlight segment where we're actually going to take a real retirement plan. We're going to break it down, show you the pain points or flaws that this couple had so you can avoid the same mistakes in your own planning. So let's hop right to it. Bob, let's talk about risk tolerance. You know, how do you really describe to someone who isn't familiar with the concept? Well, Rod, when you look at the um, reasons, the four major reasons why investors fail, something that we call the four Ps, what do you think the number one reason is why people fail? I mean, I'm going to say it's just not having a plan, right? It's like the old proverbial, people don't plan to fail, they fail to plan. Well, that's a big part of it, but the number one reason is portfolio risk. You know, over the last 42 years, all the different portfolios we've analyzed, almost 100% of those portfolios take way more risk than necessary. So it's really about determining, you know, how much risk you need to take in a portfolio. I think that's really the, the question people always have. Am I taking enough risk or am I not taking enough risk in my portfolio? So, and I think the, and isn't the investor's fault. It's really the financial services industry's fault. You know, what do you think their, their typical strategy is for helping an investor determine how much risk they should take? I mean, for my old days and your old days at Merrill Lynch, it's the good old fashioned risk tolerance questionnaire. It's like, fill out a couple of these questions, put it into the engine and they'll, they'll tell you exactly what your risk tolerance is, and then we'll build a portfolio around that. It's almost like a one-size-fits-all approach. It's even Fill worse than that when you think about it, right? You know, when you look at the, um, there used to be a men's store in Philadelphia that would advertise, you know, we have custom suits, we have lots of inventory, you know, get out of the suburbs, what they used to call it six suit territory, right? They only had six sizes. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like Wall Street. They only have six sizes. And if you fit one of those sizes, then, you know, you're going to have a successful investment experience. But, you know, just like the the, uh, the clothing salesperson, you know, you might have, you might be a 42 long and they, they put a 40 regular on you and they say, oh man, you look great. Well, that's what the <laughs> Wall Street does. And yeah, if you don't fit you know, into this square hole, we're going to fit you in there anyway. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, does it really make any sense for people to set their entire portfolio strategy based on six questions that they're going to answer differently you know, depending on what's happening in the market. Now, let's right. go back to March of 2009. How would you answer those risk tolerance questionnaires versus answering it, uh, you know, after the markets hit an all-time record high last week? Well, you know, the Dow, um, well over 22,000 right now. I remember when it hit 666 in 09, and I don't care who you were, it was a very scary time to be invested. And you know, most likely you may have panicked out at that time, but you weren't feeling like you were ready to take some risk on. That's for sure. Absolutely. And that, that's the problem. So, you know, the question is, you know, what's the right risk tolerance? So instead of, you know, looking at the typical traditional definition of risk, whether you look at the Webster's Dictionary or you now go online with your grandkids and look at Wikipedia, you know, what is risk? You know, risk is the possibility of loss or injury, but the meaning conveyed by risk varies among people, especially investors. You know, for some people, it's losing what I have. I'm so scared to death to make an investment because I might lose it. 
or it's people who don't take that first step and their biggest fear is, you know, I didn't make as much as I could have, right? If I had put it all into Amazon when it went public, you know, I could have had a tremendous rate of return. You know, I didn't make what I could have. So when we look at risk and we look at how do you invest based on your risk tolerance, it's more importantly to, you know, look at it differently, right? To look at your goals first and to come up with investments that enable you to achieve those goals and objectives as opposed to, you know, just the inherent risk or volatility, you know, of that particular strategy. Yeah. And that's something that we came up with a long time ago, Rye, and that's, you know, and that's a strategy that you and I employ every day. Well, it's a great point because let's be honest with ourselves. You know, our emotions are going to oscillate depending on how the market does, and that's why as human beings, we make terrible investors because you know, there's the old saying by Warren Buffett, when others are greedy, be fearful. And when mm -hmm. others are fearful, be greedy. But our natural inclination is to be when the market's down, like it was in 2009, is to be fearful. And when the market's going straight up, you know, we're more inclined to be greedy. <laughs> so it just doesn't work from an investment standpoint. So to your point, it's so critical to start with your goals first. Figure out where do I need to go to and how much risk do I need in my portfolio versus what is my risk tolerance is a much better question to ask and a much better question to solve for. Because you know, even if the market's going straight up, well, you may not need to have all that risk in your portfolio and participate in all the upside of the market because for every up in the market, there's going to be a down somewhere in the future. Well, it just really comes down to what you can control and what you can't control. And as we always say, time passes and markets are operating every day, neither of which cares what you think or how you feel. So when it comes to your emotions, what you need to learn to do is attach your emotional resolve to achieving your goals as opposed to trying to control things that can't be controlled. Because let's sum it up. Investing is a process-driven event. It's not event-driven. So if you stay focused on your goals, you keep it simple, you've got the highest probability of success when it comes to being a long-term investor. Yeah, exactly. It reminds me of a client a couple of years ago when the market was going up and he had a pretty conservative portfolio because he didn't need a lot of risk. I said, why isn't my portfolio going up with the market? Well, I'm thinking we have bonds over here, you have safe investments, and he did have a low risk tolerance. And I just basically said to him, look, you know, he asked me to build you a Volvo. Now you want a Ferrari. <laughs> and the great thing about a Ferrari is, yes, you may get to the finish line faster. You know, when the market goes up, your portfolio goes up more, but there's a bigger chance that you're going to spin out and crash. Whereas that Volvo, we know with all certainty, is going to get you to the finish line. And that's what you need to be thinking about. So if you're sitting there right now saying to myself, I need a portfolio that's based on my goals. I need to make sure that I have my risk in check. I'm not taking too much risk. I'm taking enough risk. Here's your time to do it. If you're one of the next 10 callers and you have over $200,000 saved for retirement, Bob and I will run for you our total financial master plan with no obligation or cost. It's a full review that's going to look at everything. So if you're bringing last year's tax return, we'll have a CPA review it. Make sure you're not paying unnecessary taxes. If you bring in your wills, your trust, your legal docs, we'll have our estate planner review it to make sure your estate plan is up to date and what changes you may need to make. And then bring in all those statements from all the different financial institutions where they're held. Bob and I will run for you our famous investment analysis spreadsheet. It's a simple, simple three-page document that's going to look at risk. Are you properly diversified? Do you need more growth in your portfolio? Do you have too much growth, too much risk in your portfolio? We're going to point out the pitfalls. We're going to look at income. Income is critical in retirement. Bob and I are going to show you how to optimize the income on your portfolio. And we're going to look at those pesky fees. Are you being overcharged on your investments? We're going to break down every fee in your portfolio, including those hidden costs you don't know you're paying. Then we're going to tie it all together into one total financial master plan to determine, are you going to outlive your money or is your money going to outlive you? Utilizing strategies we've worked on literally now for 40 years to take your family from point A to point B with the least amount of risk and the highest odds of success. So give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. If you're one of the next 10 callers and you've saved over 200000 for your retirement, our team will run for you our total financial master plan. Remember, no obligation, no cost. Just give us a call. 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 
702-752-6692. This is Bob. This is Rye at No Pain, No Gain Financial Radio. It's time for the weekly No Pain, No Gain Market Update with a team at Payne Capital Management here in New York City. Good morning, this is Bob Payne, Chief Investment Officer of Payne Capital Management. And this week on the Street of Dreams, the technology stocks claimed a major milestone, having bounced back from the dot-com bubble crash with the S&P 500's tech sector index hitting a new lifetime record high, finally topping the intraday high set way back in March of 2000. 17 years. That's a long time to wait just to break even, but a great lesson in diversification. The investors, or shall I call them what they really were, speculators, and there were a lot of them, put all of their money into tech in the late 90s, primarily because it was the best performing sector for three years. In their minds, valuations no longer mattered, and because it was different this time. As the great investor, Sir John Templeton, famously stated, the four most expensive words in the English language is this time it's different. Of course, it wasn't different, but at least after 17 years, some of these speculators, if they held on, are finally breaking even. Now, joining tech in the new all-time high list were the S&P 400 index of mid-sized company stocks. It was also joined by the Russell 2000 index of small company stocks, along with its cousin, the S&P 500 index, of large capitalization company stocks. In addition, international indices, although at not at all time record highs, hit their 52 week highs and are now up over 20% for the year. So I guess the lesson is, why speculate or gamble on which asset class or sector or even individual stock is going to outperform next? Because I can tell you, I don't know and no one else knows which asset class is going to outperform next year. I just know with a truly Diversified portfolio, we already own it. Hey, if you're wondering, do I have a diversified portfolio? Do I have speculation and risk in my portfolio that I don't understand? Why sit there and wonder when you can know? Give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. This is Bob Payne of No Pain, No Gain Financial Radio. Are these for us? Are these for us? Are those for us? Are these bagels for everybody? Are these for us? Grab a New York bagel, lather on some cream cheese, and keep listening to No Pain, No Gain. You know, if they're not from New York, they're not real bagels. It's Ryan Payne, Bob Payne, No Pain, No Gain. In this segment, we want to talk about how to spot a bad financial advisor. You know, how do you know if your financial advisor is a good or bad fit for you? Or what about an advisor that you're thinking about working with? How can you tell the good ones from the bad ones? And the first bad sign, like born under a bad sign, got to love that, that old Albert King song, Bob, would be when an advisor has too short or too long a resume. Well, what it really comes down to, right, when you think about advisors, the good news is there's lots of good advisors out there. But the bad news is they're already taken. See, the industry hasn't evolved at all. When I started in the industry back in 1975, they did a phenomenal job of giving me great training, state-of-the-art training. They helped me get licensed to get my Series 7, my 65, my 66, all the different licenses that you needed to have. And then when it's all said and done, they bring you out into the boardroom. They sit you down and they say, here's your desk, here's your phone. Go get some clients. Now, I don't know about you, Rye, but how much of your hard-earned money would you give to a 21-year-old freshly minted financial advisor today? It would make me a little nervous. I mean, considering, you know, I think about all the bull and bear markets you and I've been through and the expertise it takes to manage through that. You know, someone that yellow might be a little disconcerting to handle my whole net worth, especially if I'm getting close to retirement. Well, that's what happens because investors are really smart and they're able to tell whether you've had 40 years experience or whether you don't have a down payment on a clue. And I can tell you at 21, working in downtown Philadelphia for Merrill Lynch, not only did I not have a clue, I didn't have a down payment on a clue. And it wasn't surprising (laughs) that everybody else in my training class, 80, 90% of them failed. They, They were wiped out because it's such a terrible model. But what happens for people who do succeed, who make it, is that you're so loyal to those 
people that they open accounts with you that, you know, you feel so good about the fact that somebody recognizes your value and you become loyal to those people forever. And it's in a very short period of time where really good advisors, because once you've made all the mistakes and, you know, you've done, gone through all the steps, you become really a great advisor. But what happens is you have too many clients and you can't grow any longer. So it's, it's not a yeah. failure of the financial advisor. It's a failure of the industry because they continue to do it the same way over and over again. Yeah, and I remember from my days at Merrill Lynch and your days at Merrill Lynch as well, I mean, I had hundreds of clients. It got to the point where it was just virtually impossible to keep up with any sort of service. And one of the tenants we brought when we built Payne Capital Management, and one of the real basis why we, we moved out of the big firms, where we made a rule once you have over 100 plus clients, uh, we hire a new advisor. So you know, no one has that diluted experience because you know there's so many things that needs to be done along the way. We always talk about retirement being a journey and the tweaks that need to be made. You really can't afford to have someone, you know, casually or, you know, overburdened where they can't look at your your picture on a, on a, you know, regular basis to make sure you're on track. Well, that's why a team approach makes more sense. I mean, let's face it, you and I have well, I have gray hair, you don't, but we both have scar tissue Coming in our stomach in. lining, you know, from all the mistakes we made early on that we no longer make for our clients now. So all of our advisors get the advantage of having the expertise that we developed, you know, over 40 years. But they also have the energy and the time to really service the clients, you know, that work with us. I mean, it's just it just blows my mind. I mean, every firm that I ever consulted with, you know, the average advisor is 500 to 800 relationships, and there's no way in the world to even return 800 phone calls, you know, when things get more volatile. And some of the banks that I've been in, you know, some of these advisors are responsible for 2,000 relationships. It's just not fair. Yeah, and I think the other thing you have to think about, too, is, you know, it's not necessarily the best thing to have an older advisor. I mean, the average advisor in the industry right now is a baby boomer who's getting set on retirement in the next couple of years as well. And the worst thing that can happen to you is your advisor's retiring with you. You're sitting on that beach and you look next to you, your, your advisor's sitting on the beach too, getting his tan, yeah. relaxing. <laughs> so I think it's the combination because with, with younger advisors, and our firm is actually made up of younger advisors, you need someone who has the energy to service your account, but to have some sort of process and discipline in place. And that's kind of where you marry the experience that you and I have, Bob with someone who is younger and who does have the energy to, to actually manage that account and be on top of the relationship with you. So I think that's an important combination to have. And you want to have some sort of set process that's time tested and something that's customized to what you're trying to do as what we talked about earlier is that one size fits all approach. Take your risk tolerance test and then you fit into one of five boxes. And if you don't really fit in there, we're going to squeeze you in there. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And you know, the other thing is, right, there's that FNRA site, the FINRA site, where you can look and see, you know, where has your advisor been? How many firms that he or she work for? How many complaints do they have, you know, against them? So it's if you really want to find out if it's a good egg or a bad egg, you know, the government does a nice job now providing the history of every licensed advisor out there. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, This is a very transient business. And you have to wonder why uh, your advisor continually moves from one firm to the next firm. You know what, What's the, the rationale behind it? And that's usually a red flag that maybe they're going to get a payout if they go somewhere else, You know, if they're not able to establish themselves at one firm for, for the long haul. So I definitely think that's something to, to be concerned about um, in the process. And then what we talk about, which is a very big deal right now, is the Department of Labor has come out and is forcing the big brokerage firms to do what we've been doing now since we've been in business for almost a decade, Bob, and that's be a fiduciary of your money where you know you work on a fee base in your best interest as opposed to a commission-based salesman where the business has been for a very long time and your interests are not typically in line with a salesman who's trying to sell you a product. Well, that's the difference. That's how you differentiate whether you have a salesperson working for you or working with you as opposed to a fiduciary. You know, what you want to do is look at your file right now. Do you have a wealth projection that shows what your portfolio is going to look like, what your you know, financial plan is going to look like, not just for next year, but for every year for the rest of your life? And, and when was the last time that was updated? Take a good look at that. If it hasn't been updated in a while, 
you get somebody who's really not paying attention to you. You know, take a look at your records. I mean, when's the last time you were contacted? Now, I'm not talking about a return phone call. I'm talking about a proactive call, you know, to review with you the strategy you're following to go over and, you know, dot those I's and cross those T's. You know, that takes time and effort. And unfortunately, since most advisors have too many clients and too many households that are responsible for, you know, it's kind of up to you to keep them on top of what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, these are really the red flags. These are the signs. You know, these are the milestones that you really got to pay attention to. And, you know, if you're not seeing that, if you're not seeing that in your file right now, if you haven't had a wealth projection done, if no one's updating your plan, you don't have a total financial master plan. Well, what you ought to do is pick up the phone and give us a call. And if you're one of the next few callers and you have at least 200000 saved for retirement, Ryan and I will run for you our total financial master plan. Now, there's no obligation and there's no cost. And if you're one of the next few callers, here's exactly what we're going to do for you. We're going to have our CPA review the last two years tax returns. You know, a lot of us pay taxes, but there's no reason to pay unnecessary taxes. Let's make sure we're utilizing, you know, all the tax benefits that are legally available to us. Secondly, we want to review your estate plan. We certainly don't want your plan to be an IOU to the IRS. We want to be certain that the people that you intend to inherit your assets are properly named in those documents. And lastly, let's look at all your investment statements. It doesn't matter where they're held. It doesn't matter what financial institution custodies your assets. You know, grab those statements, put them in a shopping bag, give us a call, let us put together for you our famous investment analysis spreadsheet. This is a simple three-page document that compares apples to apples, shows you whether your performance is commensurate with the risk that you're taking. Are you truly diversified across asset classes and within asset classes? How are your fees? Are you overcharging yourself? I don't know about you, but I hate being overcharged. We're going to look at each of the fees and each of your investments to make sure that's not happening to you. And lastly, perhaps we can increase or optimize your income. Remember, cash flow in your portfolio that's produced annually is critical to your success. So, and finally, we're going to tie it all together into one wealth projection, right? To answer that age old question Are you going to outlive your money or is your money going to outlive you? Utilizing strategies that my family now has been working on for over four decades. That's correct, 40 years. We want to help take your family from your financial point A to your goals, your dreams, to your values, to your point B with the least amount of risk and as much certainty as any fiduciary can provide. So don't waste time. Call us now at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. If you have over $200,000 saved for retirement, be one of the next 10 callers, get the full review, 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. Here's your shot to do it. 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. This is No Pain, No Gain Financial Radio. Your personalized path to financial freedom awaits at Payne Capital Management. For more information, go to BeBullish.com. That's BeBullish.com. <laughs> It's time for Financial Pornography of the Week. This is where we scour the daily financial news and call out the biggest offenders of offering obscene and profane financial guidance to help you protect yourself from making any ill-advised financial decisions. Bob, what would you find this week in the world of financial pornography? You know, it's not just this week. It's been over the last couple of weeks and almost every financial publication I read, it's this anti-ETF movement that's coming from the managed money and hedge fund industry. You know, right. they're, they're seeing their assets uh, deplete almost on a daily basis and the money's moving towards, you know, what we call index funds or passive funds. And now they have an even more efficient tool, something you and I've been using for over 10 years, exchange traded funds. They're even describing them now as the gateway uh, investment, you know, to trading individual stocks. They, they, they just don't think people can handle, you know, low cost liquid investments that, you know, without their, you know, high cost, internal high cost management fees in a, in a mutual fund or hedge fund, you know, people just can't continue to enjoy these above average returns. But, yeah. you know, ETS, right, been around for 25 years. 
Yeah, I know. We yeah. started using them, I think, even cl- more like 15 years ago, Bob, almost 20 mm-hmm. years ago. Um, yeah. and, and to your point, we now have this investment that's extremely low cost for the most part. Yeah. Um, it's tax efficient. Uh huh. It's very liquid because it trades all day like a yep. stock does, but it's diversified. And the industry has resorted to the only thing they can find is it's a gateway drug <laughs> to picking individual <laughs> stocks. Like that's their only comeback for, no, 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 use my really expensive mutual fund over here that's more illiquid, as uh, underperformed, or my hedge fund over here because it's not going to be a gateway drug to picking individual stocks. I mean, what's going on here? Well, I love their, I love their argument. It's at, um, again, when you hear index fund or ETF, the industry is always speaking about the S&P 500. Well, you know, there's an index for the Russell 2000. Guess how many stocks are in the Russell 2000, right? I'm going to take a wild guess. 2,000 stocks. Yeah, and there's an index for international, emerging markets, mid-cap stocks, growth and value, real estate, you know, energy, limited partnerships. When you put it all together, there's 10,000 individual stocks held in the ETFs that we use in our portfolios. And the whole argument is, as you go in and buy some of these indexes, since they're capitalization weighted, in other words, you know, the company that has the most value, or in other words, the most successful stock is the heaviest weighting, you know, in that portfolio, that right. it's almost like a, um, you know, it's almost as if the market's creating the winner. But isn't that the premise of every active manager? That they're going to be able to pick winners over losers? Right. And the exchange traded fund, we were saying, just naturally does that because as the stock goes up, it becomes a bigger component of the entire index. And basically, it's doing that for you without any sort of guessing or, or you know, a manager trying to decide what stock's going to be best. This is automatically becoming the best stock because more people are owning it and buying it, which, I mean, it's, it's very common sense when you think about it. And it's, uh, it's a very effective strategy. And stocks are slaves to the underlying fundamentals. I mean, here's a fun fact, and I'm gonna, I am want you to give me a, a wild guess on this. But since 1980, how many of the S&P 500 stocks have been deleted from the S&P 500 index, right? Since 1980? Um, yeah. I know a lot of the stocks have changed over the last couple of decades. I'm going to say that 60% of the stocks have changed. Names. Yeah, 320 deletions. 320 out of 500. Wow. Yeah. That's so amazing. There's, yeah, there's still enough of these active managers, these traders out there who are reacting to the quarterly earnings and fundamental indicators, you know, to to set a value of a stock. So I think the way I explain ETFs and, and index funds to my clients, and I think the best way and, and the way it's best said is when you look at the way prices are set, active traders are price setters. Passive indexes are price takers. And the one thing that always amazes every one of our clients is when we show them that if they achieve just the average market return that the market has so generously given over the last 200 years, they're set for life. Right. So you don't need a manager who has some superior knowledge to outperform the market. Just receiving a market return is good enough. And I think to even sum up further, Bob, exchange traded funds in your portfolio are the new school. Mutual funds, hedge funds, or the old school. Get on the bus with the new school. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it's a prettier bus. And it's a prettier bus. I like that. You know, I found an article this week in Barron's, which is more of an anti-financial pornography article. And it talks about when you're retired, you're typically dependent on a regular flow of income from your portfolio. We talk about that on this show, that you want to optimize the income on your portfolio. Part of what our financial master plan is about But one of the problems that they pointed out is you often fall into the trap of what we call yield piggery. That's a new term. It's a new term. And and what this yield piggery is, it's a mistake of buying stocks based solely on the size of their dividend yield. So you may have done this where you said, I only buy high dividend paying stocks. And you think that's a really, really smart strategy. But that's actually not the best route to go when it comes to investing. Because there's a lot of stocks out there that may have a lower dividend or yield, but more importantly, they're growing their dividend over time. Um, And Barron's put it really nicely. They said, you need a healthy dose of green in your dividend diet. Mm. (laughs) And it really makes a big difference with your portfolio. Statistically, when you look at, and they went back over 20 years, 
and they looked at dividend growth was actually 65% of your total return. So that means, you know, stocks that actually- you say 65%? 65%. That's huge. That's amazing. Yeah. So instead of looking for, and this is why we run our diversified model saying, I'm only going to buy high dividend paying stocks, you want to make sure that you have stocks that historically have a history of increasing their dividend because one that has a low yield today may be your best winner just because that dividend yield is going to constantly increase over time. And you talk about your, your dividend aristocrat strategy, Bob, which basically encompasses that. Well, it's a great strategy because it automatically weeds out the companies who's, who aren't growing their dividend. So in other words, you have to have grown your dividend every year for 25 consecutive years just to qualify to be part of that portfolio, and you have to increase it every year. And if you don't, you just pull the, the stock out of the portfolio. But you know, when you think about yield, and that's the, I mean, it's so tempting to just go for the highest yield. There was a great writer, he's since passed by a fellow named Ray DeVoe. And Ray wrote many, many years ago, more money has been lost reaching for yield by investors than at the point of a burglar's gun. So if you think about, you know, if you're out there reaching for yield, it's kind of like the mythological Icarus, right, who, you know, who flew too close for the sun. And when he flew too close for the sun, his, his wax melted and he fell to earth. Well, when you reach for yield, what happens a lot of time is the wax melts underneath your portfolio and your portfolio falls to earth. So like, like our portfolios, Bob, you need to focus more on fundamentals and less on yields. The highest yielding stocks most often have the least stable prospects and can contain the most risk. Hey, good rule of thumb, Rye. When you look at the stock, if the uh, yield is higher than your hat size, walk away. <laughs> I like that. And if you're looking at your portfolio right now wondering, what kind of yield am I getting on my portfolio? How do I optimize it? Am I getting a riskier yield on my portfolio? Here's your shot to have the analysis done. If you're one of the next 10 callers, you have over $200,000 saved for retirement. Bob and I will run for you our total financial master plan with no obligation or cost. We're going to look at all the cash flow and income on your portfolio to make sure you're not taking unnecessary risk. We're going to look at the fees on your portfolio. Are you being overcharged on your investments? Bob and I are going to break it all down to make sure that you're not paying too much in fees, and we're going to look at diversification. Do you have risk or pitfalls in your portfolio you don't know about? Bob and I are going to point those out for you, and we're going to tie it in into our famous investment analysis spreadsheet. So we'll look at everything, and we're also going to look at the other things. If you bring in your tax return, we have a CPA that will review it to make sure you're not paying unnecessary taxes. If you bring in your wills and trusts, we have an estate planner that will review that to make sure that your legal docs are up to date and any changes you need to make to make sure they're up to date. And then we're going to put it all together into our total financial master plan to make sure that you're not going to outlive your money. Your money's going to outlive you utilizing strategies now our family has worked on for 40 years to take your family from point A to point B with the least amount of risk and the highest odds of success. Don't miss out. Give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844 844- 752-6692. If you're one of the next few callers and you've saved over 200000 for your retirement, our team will run for you our total financial master plan. There's no obligation. There's no cost. There's no strings attached. Of course, you have to call 844-PLAN-NYC, 844-752-6692. This is no pain, no gain, financial radio. How's that saying go? No pain, no gain? It's the name of our show, too, but we spell pain, P-A-Y-N-E. It's Ryan and Bob. No pain, no gain. Financial Radio. And if you want to learn more about Bob and myself, you can check us out on the World Wide Web, bebullish.com. That's bebullish.com. And if you ever have a question for myself or Bob, you can always email us, questions at bebullish.com. That's questions at bebullish.com. And if you have a really good question, we'll answer it right here on the show Sunday morning. And as always, we received a couple pretty good questions this week, Bob. The first one comes in from Tracy on Farmingdale, Long Island. She writes in, Ryan, I make too much money to contribute to a Roth or a traditional IRA after I max out my 401k 
where else am I supposed to save my retirement money? Well, first off, you still might be able to do a Roth IRA. So a Roth IRA essentially is an investment where you put money in after tax. And depending on how old you are, you could put up to as high as $6,500 a year. But the beauty of that account is all the growth and earnings on that money, you can take out tax-free later. The problem is once you make over a certain income level, you're not able to contribute to a Roth anymore. However, there's a strategy called a backdoor Roth. So even if you make too much money, you still may be able to put your money into a vehicle where the money's going to be tax-free for life. So sitting down with an advisor and an accountant you can figure that out if it's a strategy that you can utilize. So don't write off the Roth IRA just because you make too much money. Then what we want to look at is, and Bob and I, we talk about this a lot, but we talk about tax efficiency or owning things like tax-free bonds in your portfolio where all the income's tax-free. Yeah, I think in a lot of cases, people are able to build a beautiful portfolio of AA uh, institutionally priced municipal bonds at the same time, you can take a little more risk in your 401k by balancing the portfolio uh, where you get more growth in your 401k and your Roth and your traditional IRA, if that's what you have. But municipal bonds, tax-free income is the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, exactly right. And you know, even talking about, we just talked about mutual funds, exchange-traded funds. If you're going to save money after tax, you always want to do it in the most tax-efficient manner. So not only can we look to generate for you tax-free income, but also what I would call tax-efficient income because mutual funds, remember old school versus new school, are very tax-inefficient. And we've talked about this in weeks past, but when you own a mutual fund, every year by law, they have to pay out their capital gains, which can leave you with a lot of unnecessary tax. So by using more tax-efficient vehicles in your savings accounts and your brokerage accounts, like exchange-traded funds, you don't have that problem. And a lot of the dividends that pay out or cash flow can be tax-advantaged. So you know, there's a lot of things you have to look at when you're saving after your 401k. And there's a lot of ways to do that very tax-efficiently. And it's something you really need to look at when you're doing your planning. The next question comes in from Phil, who's in Brighton Beach. He writes in, Bob, no matter what I do, I can't seem to get my wife engaged in our financial planning. Is that okay? Or do I need to figure out a way to get her involved? Well, Phil, what my experience has shown is that women are way better at investing than men. So I speak for, you know, <laughs> thousands of people. So the first thing you got to do is you got to get her involved somehow because she's way better at this than you are just from my own experience. But you know, in a perfect world, both spouses are going to want to be involved in the financial planning aspect of your life. But that just doesn't work that way. You know, everybody's got a busy schedule. You know, most spouses work today or if they're not working, you know, one spouse is out there working full time. The other spouse may be a homemaker, but everybody is involved in their own day to day. And, you know, to ask them to get interested in something that they have no interest in is difficult at best. And I found in almost every joint account relationship that we've ever been engaged with, Rye, there's always been one spouse that's been the decision maker, one spouse that, you know, comes to all the meetings, that supplies all the financial information. I mean, have you seen the yeah. same thing? I have, but the one pitfall with that, and look, if your spouse is not interested, I get that. And look, I think one spouse should be the designated financial decision maker. And it's usually the natural inclination of one spouse or the other. But the mistake you're making is if you're the one who makes the financial decisions in your family is, what if something happens to you? And I had a client very recently had a stroke and mm. his wife knew nothing about the finances. And it was a complete shocker to start having to make decisions on the finances when they've never been introduced to the relationship. And it took months of education. You know, you had a spouse who was dealing with the trauma of her husband who is now incapacitated. And on top of that, you had the extra burden of now dealing with the finances. So I think it's so critical, even if your spouse is not the most involved, to sit down, have a basic understanding, know where everything is, know the team that's managing the money. So God forbid something happens to you, 
they have someone that they're very comfortable with that they know that can help them through the process. I mean, I, I can't stress enough how many times we've seen that, Bob, and how critical that is. Oh, well, that just shows to show you how financial planning is so critical, even if the other spouse isn't that interested. When you have a situation like that, I remember, you know, you have a spouse call and say, I, I, don't, I can't access the checking account. I don't know what the passwords are. I don't know where the websites are. I don't know where my money is. I don't know how to pay a bill. Without us as their fiduciary, they were lost. And and look, right, there are some people who really love to manage money, who love the markets, who are passionate about investing like we are. And you know what? I think that's great. We have tons of clients where, you know, they want to continue to make the decisions in the portfolio, but they have it written in their will. The day they pass, their fiduciary, us, are going to take over. So you just have to recognize that you don't live forever that no one has a monopoly on good ideas. It's always good to have a sounding board. But, you know, no matter how hard you try, your spouse may never be interested in financial planning or investing. You want to make certain that you have someone you trust, someone they can trust, you know, someone who's going to work in their best interest, you know, helping them to continue once you're gone. Now, if you're thinking, I have an uninterested spouse, or if you're thinking, I am the uninterested spouse, One of you needs to give us a call. And what we'd like to offer, if you're one of the next few callers and you've saved as a family over $200,000 for your retirement, my son and I will run for you our renowned Total Financial Master Plan. Now, there's no obligation and there's no cost. And if you're one of the next few callers, here's what you can expect from us. We're going to have our CPA partner review this year and last year's tax return. We want to be certain that you're utilizing every legal tax benefit available. Secondly, we want to have your estate plan reviewed, not just the will, the trust, your beneficiary forms. And if you're one of the 42% of us who haven't even bothered to create an estate plan, we want to get you along on that path. And lastly, we want to review all of your investment statements from all the different financial institutions where they're held. We don't need you to read them every month. Put them in a shopping bag, get them together, come in and see us. We'll put it down into one simple three-page document that compares apples to apples, breaks down all of your mutual funds, your annuities, your target funds, your ETFs, puts it into one cohesive snapshot to tell you how you're diversified, to show you whether you're getting the return for the risk that you're taking, to look at the balance of your portfolio. We're going to analyze the cost. We're going to break down every individual fee that you're currently paying on your investments to see if you're being overcharged. And lastly, we're going to optimize your cash flow. We're going to look at your portfolio to see what it produces on an annual basis and help to increase that income and make it more dependable. And finally, we're going to tie it all together into your own personal wealth projection to answer that age old question. Are you going to outlive your money or is your money going to outlive you utilizing strategies that we've been perfecting now for four decades? We want to help take your family from your financial point A to your point B, your goals, your dreams, your values with the least amount of risk and as much certainty as any fiduciary can provide. So give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. We have a couple slots left. If you're one of the next couple callers and you have over $200,000 saved for retirement, give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844 752-6692. Take advantage. We're going to look at everything. 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. This is no pain, no gain. Financial Radio. For all the latest information and news that you need to retire successfully, make sure you go to BeBullish.com. That's BeBullish.com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Here's this week's Spotlight on No Pain, No Gain. It's time for this week's Spotlight. Each week we dissect someone's real financial plan and uncover the flaws, or what we call pain points, that's P-A-Y-N-E, that this specific retiree or pre-retiree has so you can avoid the same mistakes with your own planning and investing And we have a very special guest on the show this morning, our star, certified financial planner, CFP, Michelle McKinnon. Michelle, great to have you on the show. Good morning. Good morning. Excited to be here. 
Well, yeah, so you worked on a case this past week. Why don't you give us the rundown and some of the mistakes this couple was making with their retirement planning? Yeah, super nice couple in their 60s. Um, one, the husband had already been retired. Um, the wife was still working. No children. So, you know, that changes the dynamic a bit. And this is very much, I call, the typical portfolio, the typical lack of planning that we see all the time. Um, right. So very really common points. Common points. No wills, no power of attorneys, no health care power of attorneys. It's always like I have the joke, the lawyer without the will. We see that all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and actually, she was in, um, you know, the healthcare practice with no, you know, healthcare power of attorney and no financial planning done. So they came to me concerned that they were going to potentially outlive their money. And I showed them that as long as they keep on the track of their current expenses and make sure they get a certain return, you know, they're set. However, no one ran those numbers before for them. And um, they were surprised to see, you know, that they could actually have their money last them through retirement, Ryan. So I love this. Again, they're working with a financial planner, quote unquote, and the sole job of financial advisor is to determine if they can outlive their money in retirement and they had no idea if they could or couldn't. Exactly. Exactly. Another big point is not only were they heavily invested in cash, right, which is going to lower their overall chances of making their retirement numbers over time, but yet again, extremely overweighted in the U.S. large cap growth and value, Ryan. Minimal Mm -hmm. diversification in their international markets, minimal diversification in the alternatives, and they've missed performance, particularly this year. Yeah. So if you look at their portfolio, and this is what I love about that investment analysis spreadsheet, you can see how the money's weighted in every one of their portfolios. And clearly here, there's an over-concentration in big blue chip US companies, which is not a bad place to have your money, but this year specifically, international stocks, emerging markets are outperforming. And over time, they do just as well as US markets. And here they have no exposure to a global portfolio, which is critical when you're trying to diversify for retirement. Absolutely. And because we added the alternatives as well as the international exposure, we actually were able to bump up their yield significantly to almost $16,000 increase, Ryan, each year. That's real money. I mean, that's like practically a car. Yeah. So when you say alternatives, you know, we talk about diversification is not just over traditional stocks, but having some real estate exposure in your portfolio, having some commodity or hard, real physical asset exposure things that spread out the risk. It's kind of like if you had a garden and you were living you know, out of what you planted in your garden, you wouldn't have a lot of different crops. And that's what they were really missing here. And by doing that, look at that increase in income, significant. Well, I think the big thing is it was the bond portfolio. I mean, they, they were underweighted in bonds. Now they have bonds with a fixed rate of return with a fixed maturity date so that their downside risk over their lifetimes, they get all their money back with interest, whether rates go up or down. Uh, I think that gives you a lot of comfort you know, when you're leaving the workforce and going into retirement, having that certainty in your portfolio makes a huge difference. Yeah. And that's a great point. It's The thing is, and this is so critical, when you're getting close to retirement, you want to have certainty built in. And Michelle, I mean, I love that. I can't emphasize this enough. If you can tell this couple, and if you could look at your portfolio and say, hey, I'm going to go from having $18,000 a year, I know with almost all the certainty in the world, I'm going to receive on my portfolio And now I'm going to bump that up to $41,000 a year. That's significantly better. That's insanely better to know I'm going to have that cash flow coming in retirement. And instead of owning bond funds, you know, we talk about this on the show a lot. Bond funds are not a safe investment. Interest rates have been going up. If you look at where rates were last July to now, they're higher today. Bond funds can be a very, very risky place to be because there's no date in the future that that money's going to be returned whereas owning an institutional portfolio bond. So, I mean, that kind of certainty is just tremendous in retirement and it's critical. You know, not having that kind of certainty in your portfolio, you're really risking it going into retirement. Absolutely. And I and I really want to piggyback off of the whole bond conversation because, you know, they looked at me when we were starting to talk about bonds and they were like, you know what, we've had no bond exposure. You know, we really don't know much about bonds. We've been fearful of them. So that's why we really haven't touched them. And I see this all the time, Ryan, that those are in their 60s. They're about to retire and they have such minimal bond exposure. It's like, what's going to happen if we have a 40% drop in the market? I mean, they're going to be out of luck. We see that all the time. 
reminds me of a, of a client that came to us in 2009. Their stockbroker didn't believe in bonds. So he had his multi-million dollar portfolio invested 100% in stocks. So he lost a million dollars in the crash in 08, a million dollars. Oh. He was 75 years old simply because his advisor said, I don't believe in bonds. And I just think that's the worst case of malpractice I've ever seen. But, you know, what I love about the total financial master plan, Michelle, is that you're not just focusing on their stocks and their bonds and their wealth projection. You, know, you also had their estate plan reviewed. What were some of the pain points that you found with your estate documents? They didn't have them, Bob. <laughs> Big um, so that was like primary one, right? I immediately had them call the attorney that we work with and we scheduled an appointment. So that was before they even sent me the statements. I said, you know, you need to have a call with the attorney. But we also got their tax return done and um, our accountant pointed out that they needed to increase their withholding and then therefore they wouldn't be paying a, a tax penalty. So, you know, those small moves can actually save people a lot of money down the road. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, and look at this. I mean, break it down to the, the big issues here. It's like, okay, I want to retire. <laughs> Let me make sure I'm not going to run out of money in retirement. Mm -hmm. Number two, <laughs> I need to have a will. <laughs> Set it up. You know, these are simple things. And number three, you got to make sure that you have a portfolio that's retirement ready. Make sure that you have consistent income coming in. You have certainty building your portfolio with principal coming due. And if you're sitting there thinking, I need these things done. These are big things that need to get done. Here's your shot to do it. Look, we have a couple slots left. If you're one of the next few callers and you have over $200,000 saved for retirement, Bob, myself, and Michelle, the CFP, will run for you our total financial master plan and we'll do it with no obligation or cost. We'll get you retirement ready. That means bring in your estate docs if you have them. If you don't have them, we have an estate planner that'll help you set that up. Make sure you're prepared. We're going to have a CPA look at last year's tax return to make sure you're not paying unnecessary taxes, paying tax penalties, and bring in all those statements, bring in those annuity statements, insurance statements, brokerage accounts, 401ks, IRAs. We're going to break it down into a simple three-page spreadsheet, our investment analysis spreadsheet, and we're going to look at all these issues. We were able to increase this couple's income by 15 grand a year. That's real money. We'll show you how to increase income on your portfolio. We're going to look at diversification. Do you have a lot of risk or pitfalls in your portfolio? Does your money need to be better diversified? And we're going to look at fees. Do you own a lot of high-cost mutual funds, annuities? We're going to break down all the costs in your portfolio. Then we're going to tie it all together into one total financial master plan. And we're going to tell you with certainty, are you going to outlive your money or is your money going to outlive you? Utilizing strategies now, our team has worked on for literally 40 years to take your family from point A to point B with the least amount of risk and the highest odds of success. So if you're looking for a financial peace of mind, give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. If you're one of the next few callers and you've saved over $200,000 for retirement, our team will run for you our total financial master plan. What's something like that worth? Well, I can tell you, you can get it at no cost, no obligation, just by giving us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-752-6692. All right. Another great show this morning. Michelle, I even make you a CFG, Certified Financial Genius. Hey, that rings a little bit better, Ryan. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it on your on your business card. Big Bob, pleasure as always. Well, Ryan, I'm looking forward to the conclusion of the Open Championship this afternoon. All right. Let it roll. <laughs> I don't think that's what you really say. Well, have a great weekend. And as always, be bullish. Information provided on today's show is provided for information purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information has been obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. Always consult with an investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action.